Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join in the discussion. Please call us with your questions and comments at area code 808-374-2014 or tweet us at thinktechhi. We've all heard the statement, if it bleeds, it leads, with regard to the news media. This refers to the news media's preference for spending the vast majority of its time focused on the violent, the salacious, and the disastrous. Reporters and producers often skip over or omit positive news and overplay negative stories. Syria is one of the countries that seems painted with a broad brush of negativity. Aleppo and Damascus are two of the world's oldest cities and cradles of civilization. And today, Ghazwan Hasna is going to share his experiences of growing up in Syria. Welcome to the show, Ghazwan. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure, because I really want people to know um, that what we see on the news about Syria is not the only things that are happening there. And you are more able than anyone I know to tell that story. So can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and where you were born and where you grew up? Um, so I was born in Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. Uh, this is where I went to the primary school, and then after that I moved to Latakia for a few years, and then I went back to Damascus. I love that city. This is where I wanted to be. And this is where I went to the college, where I studied at the College of Information Technology at Damascus University, one of the very well-recognized universities in that region, in, in the Middle East. Um, after that, uh, I got a scholarship from UK, uh, which is the equivalent of the Fulbright. It's called the Chevening wow. Scholarship for uh, Potential Leaders. And this is where I went to Manchester to do my uh, uh, graduate studies. I get a master there. Um, I decided to come back. I saw a lot of development taking place in Syria. And I went back to Syria in 2009, where I worked with um, United Nations and um, uh, European Commission on two projects, consulting the Prime Ministry of Syria on their development. Um, by 2013, I moved to Hong Kong to complete my PhD, and that's in short. Mm -hmm. But still very exciting. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, Damascus University? I understand it's one of the oldest in the world and one of the uh, most continually operating, uh, shall we say, center of intellectual thought for thousands of years. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience there? Uh, you mean Damascus or, as a city or Damascus University? The university specifically. The university is really one of the most recognized universities in the region. And um, it's really, um, I, I feel really um, grateful to be, um, and proud at the same time, to be a graduate of that great university. Um, every time I'm, I'm teaching, I just recall back uh, the great professors who taught me a lot of things. Um, you can imagine, um, I graduated from Damascus University, and I ended up being an assistant professor in a very well um, um, university here in, in the United States. Um, graduates of that university has really very, very good quality. I can tell you, for example, about just my friends. These are the people where I hang out with, um, I, I hang with them when um, I was in my um, uh, undergraduate degree. I have one of them now working in NASDAQ in London. The other one is working as a uh, research scientist um, in Microsoft. Before that, he worked in Yahoo, and before that, he worked in General Electric. Um, I have another friend. We, we did our project together, and now he's uh, getting an award for being the most innovative person in Sweden. He's now a CEO of one of the social robotics startup there. So I think just having these type of products, I think, will tell about how good the university and mm -hmm. specifically our college mm -hmm. was. So I really feel very grateful for all the professors there who taught us and yeah, who prepared us to, to be able to get these opportunities. So it's continuing to be a center of intellectual growth. Um, yes, but unfortunately not until the war started. So until the war started, you see a lot of intellectual people are leaving the country, including a lot of very good professors who are just trying to escape the war to other countries. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, 
I can't tell until 2011, yes, it was. Well, what's going on now? I mean, how has the war changed the way, say, people live their daily lives? Oh, it's, uh, it's very di I think it's difficult to, to, uh, to summarize that in words. It's, it's war. Um, I can't tell you about myself. I remember during the last few years uh, uh, before I left Syria, I think the war started seriously after I left. But some of the starting um, symptoms of this war was taking place in uh, 2011, 2012. Um, I remember, for example, even I was living in a very good neighborhood, um, I had to check my car every day. I have to tell my wife to stay at the other side of the road, and I have to check my car to see if nothing will happen. If the car is good, it's not exploded, then come and join me so I can take you to work. So I think uh, it's very difficult. Uh, people are just trying to, to escape the war, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you brought some pictures. Oh, and yeah. uh, to show us. So why don't you show us about the Syria that you know and that you grew up in? Yeah, it's definitely. So I think this is, uh, it's really very interesting. Like, through the last few years in my life, I was traveling all over the world. And I jumped from place to place. Until now, I already traveled 20 countries. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, if you look over time, how the perception of the people is changing about Syria. Um, the, the painful thing is that people do not know about these countries until there is a disaster. And then all what they know is through the media. Right. Um, even with the freedom that this Web2 technology is bringing us through social media where people can show photos, still I, I will show you something very interesting. Um, I remember when I, when I went to UK in 2017, you know, like the University of Manchester is one of the most international universities in the world, and you meet people from all over the world. And they ask you, where are you from? I say, from Syria. So many people do not know where is Syria on the map. And what is interesting is that I say, uh, Syria. Okay. So do you know any neighboring countries? Oh, yeah, we are beside Iraq. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, we know. Because at that time, the war was taking place in Iraq. So they get to know Iraq. And unfortunately, I wanted people to know about that lovely country, but in a different way. Now, if you ask anyone, um, do you know Syria? He will say yes, but the problem is how much do you know about Syria? Mm -hmm. I think they are they, they only know they only um, the first thing that can come to their brain is these ugly photos um, after the war, mm -hmm. which is really not the the pleasant face of Syria. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you this question. We have these discussions before, right? Yeah. If, if I tell you, like, what do you know about Syria before we, before we meet and discuss, what will be the first thing that you can recall? I felt ignorant, but I remembered that Damascus and Aleppo are both mentioned in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, um, and they were cradles not only of civilization, intellectual thought, but also of commerce for many different kinds of products, agriculture, slaves. Um, so, so they had important... Uh, they were important destinations for merchants and others to go to uh, conduct business. I knew that. Yeah, so that's really great, right? Not all the people know that. Like, uh, even I was talking to one of our colleagues, and um, he said that we know so much about Jerusalem because we are Christians, and Jerusalem means a lot to us. But it's the first time I know that by the time when Jerusalem was important for Christians, it, Jerusalem was just part of the great Syria. So, mm -hmm. which, because like Syria is not the small Syria that we have now. Syria was, the great Syria was including all of these countries, including Syria, Jordan, um, Palestine, and they became, diff and Lebanon, and they, they became like different countries um, uh, late after the, 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 the world war. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when we, 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 we get this um, yeah. uh, French and uh, um, uh, British um, um, who decided to, to d divide uh, the greater Syria into different parts. Let me take you through some uh, photos. I, I would like to go back to slide three first before we go. Uh -huh. um, uh, slide three. So uh, when I try to tell anyone, uh, can I please go to the previous slide, please? So when I try to tell anyone about Syria, I think usually photos talk better than words, right? Uh -huh. And what is really painful, I try to do a very simple search using Google. Uh -huh. I write best Syrian photos. I wanted to see some of the nice photos of Syria. And unfortunately, look what you can get when you, oh my when, gosh. even when you write best Syrian photos. I don't think that these are the best Syrian photos. <laughs> I really feel sorry for all those people who, who were like impacted by this ugly war. But I think Syria is more beautiful than that. 
we have beaches. The Syrian beaches are really very nice. If we can go to the, to the second slide, I want to see the photos to the right. I want to see those kids playing on the, on the very nice sand. Uh -huh. This is the city where my family came from originally. I want to see these very nice resorts and beaches where people can go and have party on the beach. I don't want to see the jihadi people who are trying or preparing to attack another city. Mm -hmm. And when I tried to, to, to search for Syrian beaches, I got the photos to the left. It was hard to mine the photos to the right. right. So that's really painful. You know, so, if I didn't know better, I would say that uh, photo on the lower right-hand corner of your screen, I could have easily said that that was Waikiki or um, maybe, let's see, other places I've been to, Mazatlan maybe, the Casa del Oro, the yeah. Gold Coast. And the photo above of the little girls on the beach, this is uh, a little bit surprising to me because they are not wearing uh, hijab. Oh, so this is another point. Um, I, will, I will go through that very interesting point. So what I will try to answer you, or what I will try to tell you, some of the facts that the people do not know. For okay. example, when they meet my wife, like here when, when we are walking and someone is meeting my wife, the first question he asked me, is she Syrian? Oh yeah, we, we are Syrians. This is how we look. We don't have to wear hijab. Syria is not a Muslim country. I will go through that and I can't tell you. Um, let's start by the location of Syria. This is something very interesting. So if we can go to the slide after that. So this is Syria, if you see at the center. Uh -huh. It has a very important um, geographical position that connects the three main continents in that region, including Asia, Africa, and Europe. And for a long time in history, if we go to the second slide, you will see that Syria played a very, very important and a critical position in connecting the different trade routes between the east and the west. Mm -hmm. So you see, for example, if you hear about the uh, Silk Road, it yes. was going through many cities. I, Silk Road wasn't like only one road. It was right. a network of roads. And some of them were going through Palmyra and through Aleppo. And these are two of the very important um, cities that can tell about the history of Syria. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if, um, if you can go to the next slide. So you see, these are one of the uh, few of the Silk Road. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, some of the routes in the Silk Road. And uh -huh. you see one of them is going through Palmyra. The, the other one is going through Aleppo. Maybe you know about okay. Aleppo and, um, and Damascus, but I, I don't know if you know about Palmyra also. Um, I don't know much about Palmyra, but I do know that because of the network of highways, if you will, that make up the Silk Road, that uh, the people of Syria and this geographic area ha were extremely diverse. Yes. Uh, many different races uh, came and intermarried, et cetera. And for many centuries, there was open religious practice and open, uh, maybe democracy is not the right word, but a, but a more open form of government than we might expect certainly from other Middle Eastern countries. Yeah, this is, this is really true. I will also go through that, and I will tell you something about the political structure. I'm not the very expert in that, and we agreed to avoid politics and regulations, but I will tell you some background about that. And what you say is, is really true. It has its roots in the history of Syria. Um, as, I, as I told you, like since I'm explaining this very important uh, okay. geographical position that connect the three continents, so if you look at the Syrian people, they look diverse. Even in my family, for example, this is what I'm telling you, like my wife has blue eyes and blonde hair. And when they see her with me here, they just ask me the first question, is she also Syrian? Mm -hmm. If I look at my kids, you have one of them who's looking like his mom and my daughter is looking like me, even in my family. So we are very diverse. We came from different places. We mixed in a very nice and harmonized way. Right. And through the, 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 the development of civilization and going through different religions, like, you know, Syria was the land of Christianity. Yes. This is where Jesus came. And, uh, and so we, you see, people are very tolerant when it comes to religions. We have different religions. We have different minorities. People used to respect each other and to, to appreciate what they have. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the rich history, for example, um, I would like to go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, yeah. And then right after you finish with that slide, we need to go to break. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, so if you look at this, this is one of the oldest alphabet that exists in the world. And it, um, they found that uh, tablet in 
um, Ogaret, which is a historical city, only a few kilometers from the city where my family came from. Um, um, it's considered one of the um, earliest alphabet that exists in the world. So that can tell you about the, the, the history, the, the rich history of Syria and how civilized that place was. Yeah, that's great. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Syrian civilization and history right after we come back from the break? We oh, need to do definitely. some housekeeping. Yes, I All will right. do. Thank so you very sit much. Tight. I am Cheryl Crozier Garcia. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, and we will be back in 60 seconds to learn more about Syria. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and today we are talking with Gazwan Hasna about one of the oldest civilizations in the world, Syria. Now, Gazwan, you were telling us uh, before the break that you and your wife are both Syrian, but you are very diverse looking. She's blonde and blue eyed, and you obviously are not. Um, can you tell us more about uh, women in Syria and the history of women's? Um, roles in society and government? Oh, definitely. This is something that we are really very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, this is also one of the misconceptions, for example. Maybe uh, people do a lot of stereotyping because, again, they don't know much about Syria. For example, as you mentioned, that you are shocked that the people are not wearing the hijab, which is, um, um, I mean, related to being a Muslim or something. And I right. told you that we are very diverse. Um, uh, let's go back to this slide. I will show you, for example, wh why do we feel very proud in Syria that even in the very ancient history, we have Palmyra. And Palmyra was, um, if you look at the map, this is the, the borders of Palmyra Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the historical empire uh, uh, that was in, in that region. And uh, the queen, uh, Zenobia, we, we used to have a queen uh, thousands of years ago. Right. And we are very proud with that until now. This is why you see, if, if we go to the next slide, please, you will see that we have it even. So these are the two uh, coins that was found in, that were found in Palmyra that have the uh, uh, picture of the queen. Mm -hmm. And uh, considering that we still feel very proud about that, it's still on our current currency. So if you look at the bottom, this is the 500 Syrian pounds, and it also have the picture of Zenobia and Palmyra historical city behind that, because we are very proud about that history. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, if, if we go one slide again, so these are few of the historical places that can tell about how old is Syria. Uh, it tells about the, the historical civilization in that place, Zenobia in the, in the middle. You have Palmyra in the left, um, in the upper um, left uh, corner. Unfortunately, now it's ruined in the war because some of the extremists, they, they came and they started even like uh, destroying the, what, what left from this. Um, from these ruins. Um, that will lead us about the, the woman um, in, in the, the middle um, of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, people do not know that. And you told me if we always wear hijab, of course, we do respect the people. We have different religions. We have friends who are Muslims. We have friends who are Christians. We do respect what you believe. And that's part of our constitution, that you're, you should belong to your country, but you should respect all what others believe, and you should respect your religions. But you can see, for example, the, the photo to the left is Miss Syria in 1952. Mm -hmm. She looks pretty, right? She's gorgeous. Yeah, she's really gorgeous. And I was very happy to see this photo. If you look at the left, um, up, um, up left, mm -hmm. uh, this is the graduation of um, the medical school from Damascus University. Wow. You see the girls and... Um, so all of those are the Syrian doctors in 1940s. 
if you look at the bottom, this is the women Syrian basketball in 1950s. These are a lot of things that people do not know about Syria. Mm -hmm. If you look how that was developed and reflected in the modern history, um, we go here, we have two vice presidents. If, if you can go one slide ahead, we have two vice presidents who are women. We have a minister, she's a woman. Um, if you go to the next slide, if you look at the picture to the right, this is the first woman who went for the parliament in 1950. She didn't win at that time, but at least she was able to go for the parliament. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the second round after her, four, four women in 1952 became members. Now in our parliament, we have 12 percent women in, in our parliament. And if you look at that photo, this is uh, the president of the parliament, and this is the only, uh, the first uh, Arabic woman or the first uh, woman to be the president of a parliament in the Middle East and in mm -hmm. the Arabic world. Mm -hmm. So that can tell you how much women is having respect in the Syrian society. Right. And they, now the women who were elected to office, they were, they were constitutionally able to run. So there was nothing in your constitution that said only men may vote, only men may serve. Not no. at all. This is why I'm saying that since 1950, the woman was able to go and go for a public office. So Syria had elected women to national office long before the U.S. had. I at don't least, know much. At least 10 years before, I think. Well, maybe not. Margaret Chase Smith, the senator of, in Maine, I think was in the 1940s. I think she was the first. But you've certainly, uh, like president of the Senate, we haven't had anyone like that that was female. Um, and certainly not in the vice presidential seats of power, although we've been trying. Um, so that's really interesting because, again, people think that Syria is rubble-strewn and oppressive to women. And I, for example, did not realize that you're a secular nation. You do not observe Sharia law as your, as your governing laws. You have um, uh, civil law. This is very important. So if you look at the history of, Sy of Syria, we were occupied by the Ottoman, uh, Ottomanian— uh, The Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire yeah. for 400 years. Uh -huh. um, in the Ottoman Empire, there are a lot of laws that are built on the Sharia and the Muslim laws. But after that, we were occupied by French, and this is where we get most of our laws. Uh, so if you look at how many courts do we have now, I think maybe if we go to the second slide and second slide, I will show you the different courts. No, the second one, please. So we have different courts in Syria, for example. And I'm not a very expert in the judiciary system, but I tried to put this information because you asked me about it once when, when we have discussion before. Mm -hmm. We have like um, court of cassation. We have high constitutional court. We have civil and criminal courts, military courts, and security courts. And I think we still have a little bit of Sharia, but not in a way that is controlling everyone, only mm -hmm. for the personal issue and to reflect respect to different religions. So if you are, for example, a Muslim and you want the marriage to be still in the Muslim, based on the Muslim laws, so you go to that court that is specialized in personal issue to complete the marriage. But if you are a Christian, you don't have to, to do that. So this is the only part which is still left. Uh -huh. from the Sharia part. All our laws are built on the French um, laws. See, I didn't know that either. Yeah. And it looks like from the slides of your judicial system that you have something that is the equivalent of our Supreme Court, which would be the high constitutional court. This is true. And then civil and criminal courts, we have those two. Um, military courts, we have those. I mean, if you watch the TV show JAG, it's all about that. What is a security court? I really don't know. As I told you, I'm not the very much expert in that, but maybe it's related to national security ah, or something. Like but again, I cannot, I'm, I'm not the expert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. But still, it's not at all the judicial system I thought you had. Yeah, I think most of the people do not know that because they do this stereotypical, um, they have this stereotypical way of like stereotyping everything in that region to be similar. So we are different from other countries in the region. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's why some of the violence may have hit Syria harder than maybe some other places? Well, I think it's difficult to, to comment on that, especially that we agreed not to touch okay. politics. But Sorry. definitely, I think, yes, part of it. Because, for example, 
we, we never hear about all of this extremism in Syria. We, I lived in Syria for 30 years. People tend to be very tolerant. I will show you some photos. Uh, before I go into that, I will just I, I tried to pull some information here from the World, World Health Organization mm -hmm. uh, to show you some of the uh, sociocultural indicators. Can, you, can, we, can we go to the previous slide, please? The previous one, please. Previous one? Yeah, there this one. Go. So these are some numbers that can tell you um, about how we are doing in sociocultural indicators. I couldn't get more recent information, maybe due to the war, I don't know, but I got this information from one of the reports published by the World Health Organization. You see, um, for example, here, like, if you look at the female literacy, it went from 47.5 in 1990s into 78% in mm -hmm. 2004, which is a great improvement, right? Right. Women at the workforce, it went from 24 to 29, which is really good improvement. Um, primary education pupils, the percentage of female is 49 in 2004, but we were even doing good even at 1990s. Mm -hmm. So that, I think this this also good to, to, to draw some light on these numbers, right? It, yeah, it's, especially it's, I think the total literacy figure in 2004 is particularly interesting. 93% uh, is one of the highest in the, certainly in what would be considered the developed world and also in the developing world. This is one point that is very important to mention. We have a free education system, and the uh -huh. primary education is mandatory. So everyone should send his kids to the school when they are in the primary school age. And when it comes to education, I think Syrian people are really very highly educated, and the education is for free. So I, we, we are a big family. We are 11 siblings. Um, yes, that's too too much. I know. Uh, <laughs> well, my mother was one of twelve, so I don't think that's too much. Oh, that's good. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think we we all went to schools. All my all my uh, siblings are doctors, engineers, lawyers, and that was something great to find because now once I came here, I do understand how difficult to be in a system where the education is expensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe that that part contributed to having these high um, uh, numbers. I'm sure it did. And, you know, I think one of the other issues we need to look at is, is, the, is the important gifts that literacy bring to uh, a community and a social system and a nation. If you can read and write, it's easier to think. Exactly. And get access to information that will inform your decisions. And hopefully everyone then has the talent available to build uh, the communities that they want. Yeah, definitely. I do agree with you. Yes, true. Yeah. So we're going to have to cut it off. I'm so sorry. Will you come back? Oh, yeah, definitely. Good. <laughs> come back another time very quickly. Yeah. Um, Gazwan Hasna from Syria, thank you so much for joining us. I am Cheryl Crozier Garcia. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, and we will be back in two weeks. Till then, take care. <laughs>